Last time we spoke, we um, it wasn't long after October the seventh. I mean, we mentioned, we discussed the fact that you had two victimhood movements essentially engaged in this fight to the death, existential fight. In the intervening period over the last few months, what is what's your perspective now looking at what's happening? When you when you maintain unrealistic goals, when when your goals are unrealistic, and the goals on both sides are unrealistic, the goal of Hamas and most of the Palestinians is to eradicate Israel. That's unlikely. It's an unrealistic goal. It's also grandiose and inflated when all you have is 40,000 people with Kalashnikovs. Yeah? It's a bit... Uh, <laughs> and the goal on the Israeli side is equally inflated, grandiose and insane, or inane at least. And that's, we're going to we're gonna eliminate Hamas. You can't eliminate Hamas. There's no way to eliminate Hamas. Hamas is the Palestinians. <laughs> Palestinians want Hamas. They will choose Hamas. And they will, even if they have a, a state, Hamas will rule the state. I mean, it's total, total nonsense. And when you have unrealistic goals, and it's very common in narcissism, when you have unrealistic goals, and now we can link narcissism to victimhood, you know, then you have two options. You confront reality and you say, I was wrong. I got it, I mean, got it wrong. I, I failed. I accept, I embrace my failure. I learn from it. I evolve, I grow. This failure and loss and pain and suffering, they're the engines of growth. So great, in a way, great. I've learned from this. This is one rea possible reaction. And the other possible reaction is to, is to falsify reality, to lie to yourself, to embed yourself in fantasy, the fantasy bubble, and then to insist that the rest of the world confirm to you that the fantasy is not a fantasy. And that this bubble is a reality, and that your goal is achievable, and that you are never wrong. <laughs> You're infallible. Both parties are doing this. The Palestinians and the Israelis. That's why the situation is hopeless. It's not only a clash of two victimhood movements. That has been very common since the 19th century. Most national movements, which created nation states throughout Europe, were victimhood movements. What was communism? Not a victimhood movement. It's a victimhood movement. What was Nazism? Not a victimhood movement. It was a victimhood movement. Zionism. I mean, you name it. Even the French Revolution. These are victimhood movements. So the victimhood movements clashed all the time. And to this very day are clashing. That's common. But the problem starts when the two self-styled victims are actually narcissists. So this is a clash of pathologies. Not a clash even of grievances, but a clash of pathologies, a clash of grandiosities, a clash of fantasies. And that's difficult to resolve because any resolution and any solution must be somehow grounded in reality. Somehow, I don't know, 10%. If the parties are so divorced, so delusional, they have zero contact with reality, there will never ever be a resolution. And this has been the situation at least since 1882. In that scenario, the the solution needs to be imposed by third parties. I don't think it's feasible. I don't think it's feasible because there's a major power asymmetry. This can be done when the two parties are basically co-equal. Co so, I mean, but there's one party which is like a, a thousand zillion million times stronger than the other party and demonstrates it daily. <laughs> ostentatiously you know mm. and there's another party which is uh refuses to accept the existence of the first party so one party rejects reality by pretending that the other party should go away that's the only solution and the other party says i have to eliminate exterminate the other the so both of them clash along an existential axis. It's not about how to divide the land and how to allocate resources and uh, historical grievances and who gets what and even reparations for the Palestinian refugees and the Jewish refugees. 
more than 400,000 people were thrown out of Arab countries in the 50s. Mm. So it's not about, it's not a transactional thing. There's no negotiation that can take place because these two narcissists injured each other, challenged each other's grandiosity, and now they want the other dead. It's an existential thing. The minimum requirement is for the other party to disappear. No, that's not the maximum record. That's the minimum. Palestinians are saying the Israelis should disappear, the Jews should go back to Europe, and then we will build our Palestinian state. The Jews are saying there's no such thing as Palestinians, it's an invention, so we should throw all of them to Egypt or to, uh, to the sea, or I don't know what, and then we will live safely. So it's not like the elimination of the other is the maximum goal. No, it's the minimum goal and upon which you can construct your future. And when there is a power asymmetry, one of the parties at least is not going to accept it. So I don't think there's any negotiable resolution. Even geographically, I'm not going to it, but psychologically, definitely, there's no way to reconcile the parties. No way. This conflict is everlasting. Everlasting. And in the sense that it will go on long after we are both dead. And uh, the resolution of this conflict would be either external conquest. I'm looking at history. There have been similar situations in history, by the way. Not uh, unique. Even Athens and Sparta, for example. So there's been... So, external conquest, like Rome at the time. That's one solution. Uh, a power comes in and conquers Palestine and <laughs> the hell with both of you. you know? Unlikely. Unlikely now, in 100 years, who knows? Uh, Russia, maybe? I don't know. So, external power. That's one solution. The other solution is assimilation, actually. Strangely. The parties somehow assimilate each other. So, we had, for example, the Slavs invaded the Balkans in the 6th century, and about 500 years later, they intermarried to such an extent that they kind of assimilated the other. So that's a solution as well. I don't know how likely this is, but who knows? Who knows? The key issue in history is who knows. And the third solution, and the most likely, unfortunately, is ethnic cleansing and extermination, genocide. That, in my view, is the most likely one in due time. And no, killing 33,000 people is not genocide. That's not genocide. Genocide is a plan to eliminate a collective based on affiliation, based on belonging to the collective. The collective could be anything. could be cultural, could be national, could be... So the parties are driven gradually into a genocidal solution. Rwanda, you know, genocidal solution. And I think ultimately... Ethnic cleansing or genocide are the only practical solution. One of these two have to go. And I know it's not, not politically correct to say this, but I think that's what's happening. One of them has to go. One of them somehow. Now, you could say Palestinians are much weaker than Israelis, so it's much more likely that Israel will kill the Palestinians. Not really. Because Palestinians are embedded in a sea of Muslims and Arabs, which far outweigh the population of Israel. And because the consensus in Israel, within Israel, is breaking down. You see, countries change borders or cease to exist in one of two situations. When the internal consensus breaks down or when the external consensus breaks down, when other countries, uh, you know, impose sanctions and so on. In the case of Israel, I think that the main threat is the breakdown of the internal consensus. Add to this something like 250 million Arabs in close proximity and another 400 million if you take the Muslims in the area. And I don't think it's a foregone conclusion who will be subject to genocide. I don't think so at all. But ultimately, one of these two warring parties has to give way and disappear. I am afraid this is the only... That is a grim um, prospect. Um, speaking of warring parties, the culture wars, we have a, a war playing out, metaphorically at least. Um, no violence, 
most of the time, but it is a pretty um, desperate, vicious, uh, vindictive, almost pathologi pathological fight between trans activists um, and feminists. Um, and it's playing out very publicly. When you're looking at that from a psychological perspective, First of all, what do, what do you think is going on there? Like, I, I have had discussions recently with, I spoke with Professor of Criminology, Matt Williams, and I mentioned the idea that perhaps, you know, the old school methods would you go in, the, the Greek method, you go into the theater, you debate in the marketplace of ideas, the best ideas wins, problem is solved. We, we're, not, we're not seeing that anymore. You know, what, what, when you look at it, what, what are you seeing from your perspective? There is a confluence of uh, several historical trends. So Campbell, the famous sociologist, Bradley Campbell, said that we have transitioned from the age of dignity to the age of victimhood. So the first trend is victimhood. We discussed it already. The second trend is what is known as negative identity formation. It's when you define yourself not as who you are, but as who you are not. So when you put together victimhood, with negative identity formation, you get the the offshoot are positions which are not debatable. Because if you are a victim and your abuser is not you, you have no common ground. Nothing is shared. And you see it, of course, in partisanship in Congress. And so it's a, it's a global phenomenon. And if nothing is shared, no communication is possible. Communication, communication assumes that you share some attributes or some things with, with your interlocutor. Otherwise, you cannot, at least a language, if nothing else. Otherwise, you cannot. Uh... Now, the trans movement is a private case of a much bigger trend. It's when we take clinical diagnoses and convert them into social diagnoses. There is a clinical problem known as gender dysphoria. It's real. It's absolutely real. There are many studies and so on. People who don't feel comfortable with their own gender and sometimes with their own bodies and would like to change their bodies and change, consequently change their gender. That is a real phenomenon. But now you take this real phenomenon, you amplify it a thousandfold, you convert it into a victimhood position you define yourself in opposition to others, in contradistinction to others, it gives you a list, it generates a list of grievances, which you then convert into commensurate rights, which you then can impose on society in the form of obligations, so it becomes profitable. It pays, all this activity pays. And I think that's where the trans movement has gone. I think that's where feminism is done as well. It's a, it's a truly cancerous uh, phenomenon which destroys the ability to communicate and to reach common ground and to destroys, destroys. Because communicating is perceived as a, as a, a concession that undermines the grievance. I mean, if you can communicate with your abuser rationally and reasonably and reach modus vivendi and consensus and so on. So mm -hmm. your abuser is not that bad. So if your abuser is not that bad, are you sure you're that much of a victim? It undermines your position. Communication itself becomes a subversive act. Subversive act to be, neg to be avoided at all costs, negated, undermined, and frowned upon or, or you know, to become socially unacceptable. And so all these movements, you mentioned feminism, you mentioned trans, doesn't matter. All these movements now pride themselves on their, on their seclusion. They pride themselves on their hermeticism, on, on their isolation from, from others. These are exclusionary movements, not inclusionary movements. Feminism started as an inclusionary movement. Even in the 60s, feminists were talking about educating men. To become more feminine and more accepting and more. Today, these are men haters, absolute men haters. <laughs> no, I can't think of a single exception. 
and I'm following the film closely. These are man haters to the letter. You know? And similarly, uh, sexual orientation movements, because the trans is only the latest, right? homosexuals, gays, and so on. Sexual orientation movements started off as attempts to communicate that difference doesn't justify discrimination and so on. They were, in, in a sense, civil rights movements. But now they're not. Now they are in your face, defiant, demanding, entitled, self centered, narcissistic, aggressive, abrasive movements. Ironically, who suffers? People with real needs, people with real gender dysphoria, they suffer. Maybe women who are oppressed and suppressed in pockets of what, what they call patriarchy. These women suffer because feminism is a terrible name nowadays. The trans movement has a terrible name nowadays. So what, this, what have these people done? What have they accomplished except uh, sidelining their constituencies by becoming radical and extremists? Is this distinguishable from Muslim fundamentalism? I don't think so. What did Muslim fundamentalists accomplish except create a stereotype of the Muslim as a, a crazed terrorist with the... What's the big accomplishment? I don't understand. They ended up with no territory. They, millions of Muslims were killed. What did Muslim fundamentalism accomplish except tarnish the image and name of Islam, their alleged constituent, constituencies? No. All these victimhood movements are self-defeating and self-destructive because they are narcissistic. All narcissists, all narcissists, no matter how accomplished in the short term, end in devastation. A narcissist ends badly. He could be the greatest billionaire, the most amazing president, and so on, and then he will destroy it somehow. He will end in in a calamity, the, these victimhood movements will all end in calamities, in a calamitous way, and their constituents will pay the price. And we're beginning to see this, you know, the regression in women's rights, abortion, and we are beginning to see the backlash. Had they been less um, extremist, less radical, less, I think a dialogue was going on very well, well into the 80s, there was a dialogue. Absolute dialogue, and many of the demands of feminism were accepted and adopted as laws, and, and then they they went crazy, they radicalized. Similarly, Muslims, Islam, there was a dialogue going on with the West. I remind you of Edward Said, Orientalism, Orientalism. There was a dialogue going on with the West, I think well into the 90s actually, between Islam and the West, even between Islam and Jews. And then Al-Qaeda. Mujahideen, ISIS, you know, and there's the end of the story. They allegedly represented pure Islam, Wahhabist Islam. The, the purity, the core feature of these movements is their purity, because when you are pure, outsiders, others cannot belong to you. It's called, technically, it's called alterity. Alterity, that means the other. They, these uh, movements capitalize on stigmatizing, stereotyping, and rejecting the other. This is their core message. Not about, so this is negative identity. You know? It's a bad situation. It's a bad situation because the main victim of the past 50 years, or 30 years, let's say, the main victim is the ability to communicate. I think we lost it completely. This inability to communicate. Anyone listening to this interview, if they dislike my views, disagree with me, they will shut me off. They will turn, turn to another video. They will never sit and say, okay, let me listen. Maybe, you know, you never know. Maybe I can learn something. Maybe I can be convinced. But no way. Are you kidding? No way. It is a, there, there's definitely a problem with emotional resilience and a willingness to confront ideas that are challenging. Um... And I, it's difficult to pinpoint where that's coming from. There was a, the marketplace ideas of ideas and, and healthy discussions and debates was, was a long tradition in Western culture. It goes back to the Greeks. Um, but we are slowly, methodically 
removing it and diminishing it because we're people don't want their feelings not to be validated or they don't want to be challenged intellectually because perhaps it's, it's a challenge emotionally as well to their ego to their some sense of self they might have to say something like oh my god maybe i was wrong if you're a narcissist exactly if you're a narcissist you're always right mm. if you're a narcissist you're infallible never make mistakes never get it wrong and if there's an opinion which contradicts your own and sounds actually convincing and reasonable that's a threat that's narcissistic injury you would avoid it at any cost and so you have thought you have thought silos and echo chambers and you know and of course social media is just a technology it just allows people to Social. It has all the hallmarks and all all the imprints. This is coming from social media. Social media is helping it accelerate. to accelerate. No, I think it started before, but yeah, it accelerated. It accelerated, yeah. I, no, I think it started before, but it accelerated. Uh, it's kind of a catalyst. It, uh, and so, if you ask me, who, what is the only victimhood movement uh, that is legitimate? Uh, communicators, interlocutors, <laughs> ability to. The only victim, true victim, long-term victim, is uh, the ability to exchange ideas, and fertilize each other, and come up with consensus, solutions, compromises, and so on. So we are escalating. We are radicalizing all the time. And we think implicitly that this process has an end. It's like, ah, okay, we'll escalate up to here. Radicalize up to No, this is a self-feeding. It's... it's it's a feedback loop. It's it's self-enhancing, self-reinforcing. So there's no end to extremism and radicalism. Ask the Nazis in Auschwitz. There's no end. Anti-Semitism is a great case study because the other, the Jew, was the first case where communication was barred, not allowed. Communicating with the Jew was declared by the church to be illegitimate. So the Jew became the excluded other. And so we started with anti-Semitism. And in the beginning, anti-Semitism was pretty benign. You know, they put them in ghettos and they didn't allow them to engage in certain professions and so on and so forth. No one died, initially at least. They were expelled from some countries. Okay, it was mostly administrative. I call it administrative anti-Semitism. Then anti-Semitism became philosophical and economic and, and it escalated and escalated and escalated. There was no end to radicali radicalization and extremism. Protocols of the of the elders of Zion and this and the Dreyfus. And, and he escalated and continues to escalate. And finally culminated in Auschwitz. And had Hitler been on the right side of history, Auschwitz would have been only the beginning, not the end, but the beginning. Because there's no end to how far people can go with extremism and radicalization. Simply no end. No end. Yeah, no, I agree. And what I'm concerned about, what I'm concerned about is um, on so many different levels, I'm concerned about how the world, the, the growth of anti-Semitism. Um, but I, I have Jewish friends, I have Israeli friends. There is a distinction. Jewish, Jew, they are very, very different people in many ways. You know this yourself. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm just very concerned that what's happening in Israel will have a global effect and will manifest in actual physical harm. It will. I just said that there is no end to extremism and radicalization. Once you, once you start this machine, it's perpetual mobile. You can't stop. Mm. The machine has been started in October 8. This machine has been restarted. It was dormant, dormant for a while. It's been restarted. And now there'll be no end to radicalization and extremism. Last question I want to ask you. Um, it was something we touched on before. I wanted to get your perspective again. A number of commentators are, are talking about the replication crisis in psychology. Not only in psychology. Um, yeah, that's true. That's true. But in the social sciences in general, in sociology as well, how concerned are you? I mean, are we going to have to bin, put in the bin everything? No, absolutely not. We just have to get rid of the narcissists in these professions who claim that they are sciences. These are narcissists. Whoever claims that psychology is a science is 
deluded in the best case, and probably a narcissist. When your raw material is mutable and is impacted by your, by your study, and human beings are impacted when they are exposed to study, <laughs> then you cannot have a science. Period. Imagine that every time you looked at the sun, the fact that you looked at the sun would change its orbit. Could you have physics? You know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, psychology, anthropology, sociology, and economics, as Kahneman, Kahneman just died a few days ago. Right. 90 years of age. 90 years of age. Holocaust survivor, by the way. Kahneman... Was he? I didn't know that. Was he in Auschwitz? Was he in... Uh, not Auschwitz, no, but he, he had to hide in France in his uh, childhood. He hid, he hid for a okay. while. His father died. It was a big mess. But he was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, the, rest, the rest of the neighborhood was picked up and sent to Auschwitz. They escaped. And he hid, he hid in a barn, in a barn for like half a year or something like that. A year? I don't, I don't remember the details. But he's a Holocaust survivor, technically speaking. And he came, of course, with behavioral economics. And uh, so all these disciplines, so-called social sciences, and I'm reminding them of physicists. I have, I can compare, you know, all these so-called social sciences are pseudosciences. If they have a pretension to science, they're pseudosciences. What are they? They're great at nosology, classification, description, collection of material, organization, organizing material in ways which yield new insights and new ideas. In short, they are forms of philosophy. To cut a long story short. Indeed, only, only 300 years ago, all these were branches of philosophy. Until money entered the education system and people began to understand that if they pretend to be a science, they can get grants. And that was the end of it. And everyone became a scientist in, in a white robe. And today, unfortunately, when they teach psychology, they teach you mostly statistics. I'm kidding you not. Most of the syllabus or curriculum is statistics. No one has heard of it. Anything before 1985, before Bandura, let's say, is dead. They don't teach Freud, not Jung, not, uh, but not even, you know, or later, object relations, I mean, nothing. All this is dead. It starts in 1985. Why it starts in 1985? Because these were the first kind of uh, theories which could be tested in large studies. So I I think all the... I, I don't think we should be... I, I think there are great discoveries, amazing insights, richness, cornucopia of, of, of a wealth of incredible... You know, it's same you the same thing you have in literature. Dostoevsky was a great psychologist. You know, so you don't bin these things. They're treasures. You just cut the bullshit and the pretensions and the self-aggrandizement and the grandiose claims as to who you are. Who are you? A psychologist is a person who observes other people, describes their behavior using a highly specific language and so on, and then classifies his observations within an osology, a classificatory system. End of story. That's what psychology is, period. And every great author in human history has done the same. And every great philosopher has done exactly the same. Schopenhauer, uh, Nietzsche, they're all, they're all psychologists. So that's it. And uh, we just need to get rid of the pretensions. The rest is it's perfectly great. It's, I think huge work has been done. Even economics, huge work has been done. Economists so. might disagree. You know, economists, I think, what is it called? The queen of social sciences, the queen of sciences. Oh, give me a break. People use mathematics, they think they're scientists. I'm not mm. kidding you. If you confront an economist, by the way, I, I spent 20 years of my life as economic advisor to governments. I don't know if you even know this. I know economists, I work with economists, and I was considered for a very long time an economist, actually. So if you confront economists and say you're not a scientist, you're a branch of psychology, you're just a branch of psychology. No, what are you talking about? We have models, we have graphs, we have statistics, we have mathematics. So 
Do you know how many cranks use mathematics? Do you know how many nutcases uh, uh, draw graphs? Language doesn't make you make you anything. It's a tool, you know. Mm. Economics is a branch of psychology. I fully agree with Kahneman and Tversky. You know, it's an absolute branch of psychology, and psychology is a descriptive science. You know, botany, for example, started this way. Botany, Linus was walking the fields and drawing plants. He was making a compendium of all the plants. This became botany. Uh, psychology is the botany of human minds. Simply. Nothing more, but nothing less also. It's a major undertaking to map the human mind, to kind of have a repository or a database of all human phenomena. But it's philosophy. Not a science. I know science. I do science. I'm active in physics. I'm not just with a degree. <laughs> when I do science, I know the difference. The Also the experiential difference of doing science and doing psychology. It's uh, nothing in common. They have nothing in common. So, um, yeah, no, I, I get your point. Yes, so as long as we don't confuse the two, it's important. But the... the um... Replication crisis is a reflection of yeah. the fact that the claims about these sciences are wrong. Yes. The replication crisis is just proof that they're wrong. That's all. If I observe you right now, I'm telling you, listen, you're in a study now. This will affect you. You'll become self-conscious. Your behavior will change by the virtue of the yeah. fact you are being observed. Yes. It's, it's like in physics. In physics, when I want to active. observe... In physics. I want to observe yeah. an electron. So I send a photon, I send a light particle from my eye to the electron. And the light particle bounce, uh, bounces off the electron, comes back to my eye. But when the light particle bounces off the electron, it diverts it, it pushes it away. So the information I get is already wrong. It's the same with human beings. When you conduct studies, you change them. And there's another problem. I conducted a study on you today, and I want to study you tomorrow because you are the subject. You're not the same person. Mm -hmm. You had a fight with your wife. You were mugged. You watched a movie, harrowing movie. You read something. You spoke to some Vakni, which is a traumatizing experience. You're not the same person the next day. I cannot, by in principle, I cannot have the same raw material from one day to the next. How can I replicate my, my experiments? It's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. By the way, the replication crisis is a crisis. 80% of studies cannot be replicated. It's not 8%. It's 80. What are we talking about? Imagine in physics, we couldn't replicate uh, planetary studies at this rate. I, I just watched a series on television, on Netflix, a three-body problem. And in the three-body problem, they access a, a planet, never mind, and this planet has three suns, three suns. Now, in physics, we cannot solve the problem of three bodies that move concurrently. So this planet is in total chaos. It cannot create a physics because the movements of the three objects cannot be predicted. That is psychology. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost like it's a branch of literature. It it's, is. It's I keep saying in all my videos that it's liter it's a literary art form. Freud was a great author. Great. But it's, it's where you find meaning, though, as well. You also, know, you find so meaning. Viktor literature. Frankl, Viktor Frankl, yeah. and so. Yeah. Seven, seven out of the ten greatest psychologies. They're coming. They're coming for you. Ah, <laughs> Man's search for meaning. Victor Man's search for meaning. Frankl. Yeah. Yes. Seven out of the ten greatest psychologies. Theoreticians in psychology. Never never studied psychology. Never. Freud was not a psychologist. Melanie Klein was not a psychologist. Winnicott was not a psychologist until much later. Seven out of ten were not psychologists. Even Erickson was actually not a psychologist. That's why Harvard refused to give him a professorship and so on. So it tells you something. It tells you something about the nature of the field that you don't have actually to be. It's not a discipline, it's not a science. It tells you a lot. So 
I think if we get off the high horse, and I mean, it would benefit the field. If we are much more humble, there's no humility. It's a very grandiose, narcissistic field. On that note, Sam Wagner, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure yet again. Thank you. Thank again you for sometime. Thank you for I surviving. <laughs> now you now you can claim to be a victim. No. <laughs> well, happily survive, very happy. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Bye. Thank you. See you again. Take care. Yeah. Boom.